And there are people who are kind of arrogant in, in the sense of it's just a sheer self-assertiveness that has, if you put it in words, is it's good because it's me. There's something kind of absurd about people like that because it's, it's a kind of just sense of entitlement, a kind of inflatedness of the ego. Inflated things are actually hollow and just full of hot air, right? And this is the way with a lot of inflated egos. They're quite, they're quite empty and full of hot air. It's because it's a kind of purely subjective self-assertion. But the fact is, is that if you have people who are measuring themselves by objective standards, on the one hand, that does entitle them to look upon people who don't measure up as well and say, well, I'm better. But that's a merely comparative judgment. And comparative judgments aren't worth that much because it's precisely because one is looking to an objective standard that one can make the comparison. But the standard isn't what other people are doing. The standard is the standard, right? And so people who have this tendency, like Socrates, when they look at their fellow men to be somewhat disdainful of their failings, are on a deeper level, level far, are really far more humble because it's precisely the objective standard that they're measuring themselves by, not their comparative standards of their other men. And this is the distinction between an orientation towards truth and an orientation towards opinion. Right? If you think that everything's just a matter of opinion, which is the way rhetoricians and sophists think, then when you talk about the good, well, there's my opinion and there's your opinion, right? And who's the final authority? It just becomes a question of who. For Socrates, the issue is not who, because it's not a matter of opinion, it's a matter of truth. When you raise questions about what's good, what's the good life for a human being. And because there's, a, there's a, an objective, non-personal standard, there's a tendency for him not to can speak too concerned with comparative judgments between himself and others, because the real standard is not how different he is from other men, but how different he is from what's really good. And so the, that I think at the core of Socrates is, is, is a really, I think, honest and, and somewhat humble sense of his own worth, uh, which, measured by the standards of objective perfection, might be pretty far off. Even though, you know, if he wanted to console himself, he could look at, you know, the general run of humanity and say, well, at least I'm better off than they are. That's not going to be enough for him, right? You know, a lot of times people, when they're sick, or something bad has happened to them, they, they feel dejected or they feel upset. And one way of consoling them is to say, well, think about all the people in Bangladesh right now or something. It's to try and bring in a comparative judgment, right, in order to make them feel relatively better off. Now, we all try and console ourselves that way. Okay? There's a psychological necessity of it. The reason why one's initially dejected is because one's measuring one, one's condition by standards that are not comparative or relative. So if you feel depressed or dejected because you messed something up, you're looking to standards that you regard as somehow objective rather than comparative standards. Because, face it, if we only judged ourselves by relative or comparative standards, we'd all feel pretty good about ourselves because there's always somebody worse off. Yeah. Right? There's always somebody worse off, and we would all be very content with ourselves. But, but that's not the way that we generally think. It, it, it's a slim kind of consolation, and sometimes we grasp at that straw. But Socrates is pessimistic about human behavior, but he's also, I think, very earnestly self-critical, because he, value, he judges himself by the same standards that he judges everybody else which is different from the kind of person who judges other people compared to himself. Well, we've, uh, we've looked at Socrates um, talking about the, uh, the great statesmen of Athens and uh, arguing that they've all been just pandering to people's vices and have made people worse rather than better. There are a few things that I want to point out before we go into this last great myth. On page 122 is, is a very rich part. Remember Socrates set out this elaborate analogy, and the analogy was basically in terms of, first of all, I guess I could put it back up on the board again. 
But remember how, say, for the body, the, the art that, produce, that imparts health is gymnastic and removes sickness is medicine. For the body, what uh, imparts the appearance of health is cosmetics, and what removes the appearance of sickness is cookery. Then with the soul, the art that imparts health is legislation, and what removes sickness is punishment. And that which imparts the appearance of health to the soul is sophistry, and the art that removes the appearance of sickness from the soul is rhetoric. And so you can say things like, legislation is the gymnastic of the soul, or gymnastic is the, uh, the legislation of the body. And you can work out these analogies that way. Uh, sophistry is the cosmetics of the soul. Socrates really does believe that properly understood legislation, even in the political sense, has to be something that improves the, the quality of a person's soul. And before, I guess, this becomes a believable notion, we first have to establish that legislation makes any difference at all with people's souls. And by legislation, he, the, the, the Greek word is, is uh, legislators and nomo, nomothetes. It's a person who lays down nomoi. What are nomoi? Well, we translate them as laws, but it's a broader concept than laws because it refers to customs and conventions. Anything that's normative, the word mores uh, would be included in this. Not just statutes on the book, but mores, um, moral uh, opinions and practices and things like that. All of these things would be, are, are being discussed under the rubric of legislation. Now, is it the case that the customs of the society have an effect on the characters of the people who live in it? Very clearly, it is the case. And there's this notion called national characters, which, of course, people now try and disavow and pretend like it doesn't exist because what it really consists in are stereotypes, right? There are certain stereotypically German or stereotypically Italian features. And why are Germans uh, generally different in their sense of humor than Italians or English? It's because uh, they have different laws, different customs, and so forth, and so their characters are formed, their tastes are formed in different ways. So, you know, it's, it's widely reputed that Germans like uh, very literal, are very literal-minded, and so they don't get ironic or subtle humor, but they love slapstick and cartoons. And a friend of mine was t telling me about a bar he visited in Berlin, and he was in there, and there are all these Germans watching Bugs Bunny cartoons, and just roaring with laughter and slapping the tables, and just, they were really into it. They were watching Roadrunner, Bugs Bunny. It was all completely physical, and they were just really into it. But there are very few German comedians who are very sort of subtle and ironic. There's this one guy, Lorio Van Bulo, who's probably the most, or Von Bulo, what am I saying? Uh, he's not Dutch, he's, he's a German, Von Bulo. He has about as subtle a sense of humor as, as, as the Germans get. And it's still kind of, kind of slapsticky and fun, you know, it is funny, it's definitely funny. I think they love to hate Americans, and Jerry Lewis is, uh, is <laughs> eminent, is such a buffoon. I, I really think that's part of it. Uh, you know, um, I remember the, uh, years ago when Euro, when Euro Disney opened, Saturday Night Live reported that, uh, uh, you know, Euro Disney is now opened outside of Paris. As expected, the French have declared Goofy a genius. Right? Uh, the, the French soul is different from the German soul, from the American soul. Why? Because they have different nomoi, different customs. Now, the, the, the next question is, well, can certain customs then make a soul better or worse? If you live in a society that has laws and customs that encourage excellence, chances are people will be excellent, right? If you live in a society with laws and customs that encourage uh, yes. bad habits, you're likely to have bad habits. We're marked by the societies we live in, and therefore we're marked for good or ill by the societies we live in, and therefore, you know, the choice of laws and customs is, is a deeply moral choice, and it has an enormous impact on all of us. And so at the top of 122, about ten lines down, Socrates says, I think that with a few Athenians, so as not to say myself alone, I put my hand to the true political art, and I alone of the men of today practice politics. 
inasmuch as it is not with a view to gratification that I speak the speeches that I speak on each occasion, but with a view to the best. This is what true politics is, right? Bad, false politicians are panderers. What does that mean? They pander to whatever preferences and views that people have already. And what they tend to do is they tend to confirm people in their follies and their vices and their illusions in exchange for what? In exchange for power and acclaim. That's false politics. And that makes people worse rather than better. Whereas true politics speaks the speeches that it speaks with an eye towards the best, with an eye towards improving human beings. And true legislation would be an art of improving the soul. And this is why Socrates believes that statecraft is soul craft. Yeah. properly understood. Even, you know, and even bad state craft is soul craft. It just makes bad souls. You can't separate the soul from the city. You can try. And there are people who are relatively more emancipated from their social context than others. But that is only something that happens relatively late in life. And they get their hands on you from the very beginning. Uh, you know, Stalin said, give me a child when he's three and I'll have him for the, uh, for before he's three and I'll have him for the rest of my life. He said, give me Hollywood and I'll rule the world, too. And he was right about both things, and thank God he didn't get a hold of Hollywood. Well, actually, actually, he had, he, he had, he had a very strong grip on it, as it turns out, uh, but, uh, <laughs> stronger than he did. Well, no, there were a lo lot of Hollywood. Oh, no, but the, the thing about, the great myth about Senator McCarthy is that these people weren't communists, but virtually all of them were. Yeah, we, we found that all these people who were supposedly victims of paranoia were really actually Soviet agents after all, and they were working actively for the overthrow of the American government and to inject communist propaganda into the media. So McCarthy was right. But anyway, he says, now... What I'm going to tell you is what would happen to me if I were to be put on trial. And, of course, here he is prophesying his trial here. Uh, it's, it's in the same paragraph. It's between 521E and 522A. He says, I will be tried as a doctor accused by a cook who would be tried among children. For consider what such a human being caught in these circumstances would say in defense if someone accused him and said, Boys, this man here has done many bad things to you, to you yourselves, and he corrupts the youngest of you by cutting and burning, and he causes you to be at a loss by reducing and choking you, giving you the most bitter draughts and compelling you to be hungry and thirsty, unlike me who regale you sumptuously with many pleasant things of all sorts. What do you think a doctor caught up in this bad situation would have to say? Or if he told the truth that, quote, I did all these things, boys, in the interest of hell, how great a clamor do you think would rise up from such judges? Wouldn't it be great? And so he's, he's, he's exploiting this analogy that he set out before, and he's saying, look, now, if I were a doctor on trial in front of children, and my accuser were a cook, what, what could I do? The children are impressionable, they're foolish, you know, they're you know, certainly relative to adults, and they're the ones who are going to be completely sub subject to pandering. And who's the panderer? It's the cook. The cook gives them the feeling of hell. Sweets. Sweets, yeah. yeah. Whereas the doctor gives them real hell. He's saying, there's no way I could defend myself as a doctor accused before a jury of children by a pastry cook. <laughs> and he says, and the same thing applies... If I were, a, uh, if I am a true legislator accused before the Athenians by a sophist or a rhetor, right? These people are panderers, and they have created a people who are immature, childish in their way, and uh, and want to be be flattered and pandered to. And I'm going to be saying up there, I'm only doing what's good for you people by telling you that your lives are illusions. I'm doing this for your own good. He says, wouldn't there be a great outroar? Of course there would be. If I stood up there and said, the unexamined life isn't worth living, and you're not examining your lives, wouldn't there be a great uproar? Of course there would be. And so Socrates is saying, again, there's no way I can defend myself from injustice right, against panderers. And that's the great problem. If, if you're not willing to lie and pander to people's follies, 
then it's very easy for you to be slandered amongst the many. Whereas the people who pander to the follies of the many become famous and rich and, and, uh, and acclaimed. You know, they're the ones who get off scot-free. Right? Um, so this, this is, a, uh, I think, a brilliant use of this metaphor. Now, at the center of 123, Socrates talks about helping oneself. And this makes very clear the essentially self in, self-oriented nature of, of ancient Greek philosophy. The ancient Greeks didn't have any notion of altruism. You're virtuous by helping others. They, they really thought that the primary beneficiary of, of, of your action should be yourself, properly understood. It doesn't mean yourself as a stomach or a set of genitalia, right? <laughs> it, uh, it doesn't mean self-indulgence in that sense, but it means self-perfection in the moral sense. So Socrates talks about this, starting about ten lines down. He says, If at any rate... He has that one thing, Callicles, which you have agreed on many times. If he has helped himself so as neither to have said nor to have done anything unjust regards either human beings or gods. Okay. He's talking about the person who is on trial. Okay. The good man on trial. If he has helped himself so as neither to have said uh, nor to have done anything unjust as regards either to uh, either human beings or gods. For this kind of helping oneself has been agreed on by us many times to be the strongest. If someone convicted me by by refutation of being powerless to help myself or another with this kind of help, then I would be ashamed, whether refuted among many, among few, or alone by uh, one man only. He says, if I don't have the power to benefit myself in this most important sense, namely to take care of my soul, I would be ashamed to be shown to be weak in that way, to be powerless in that way, because that's what true power is, and true freedom, is, 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 is goodness in some sense. Doing what you really want, which is becoming the best person you can be. Okay. Okay. And if I should die because of this incapacity, I would be sorely vexed if I died because I didn't have the capacity to make myself a better human being. But if I came to my end through lack of pandering, lack of flattering rhetoric, I know well that you would see me bearing death easily, for no one fears dying itself, who is not at all, who is not all in all most irrational and unmanly, but he fears doing injustice, for to arrive in Hades with one soul full of many unjust deeds is the ultimate of all evils, and if you wish, I am willing to tell you a rational account that this is so." And then what he does is he spins out a story which he says you're going to dismiss as, dismiss as an old wives' tale and as a myth. But it's not. This is a rational account. And this is very important as a segue to the next class because Socrates is always ending dialogues with myths. And what's the, what's the role of, of Plato's constant appeal to myths? And to, to, to just give a little bit of context here, Socrates is always taking up traditional Greek myths and reworking them. And he gives many different accounts of the fate of the soul after death and the underworld and the afterlife from dialogue to dialogue, which is very strange. What licenses him to transform these myths and to be somewhat cavalier about making them all consistent? He says that these aren't mere stories. They're rational accounts. And, And... and, and so what makes them rational? And really, there, there are two questions here. What gives Socrates the right to transform these accounts of the afterlife and the soul from dialogue to dialogue? And what makes them rational, these accounts, as he says here? Well, the same answer, I think, suffices for both questions. The goal of these myths is the, is the care of the soul. It's psychagogy in, in this term that he uses, leading the soul and caring for the soul. Socrates tells these stories about the nature of the soul in the afterlife because he thinks that these make the soul better. Now, the immediate question is this. Well, does he believe then that they're true? Um, and there's an important, there are important issues here. There are a lot of people who say that Socrates just tells these stories and that they're mere stories because he wants to persuade people. These are noble lies, right? But he himself could never believe them because no one can be deceived by their own swindle. 
I think that the deeper answer is, is something like this. Socrates does believe that something like these stories uh, is true. Uh, he's, he's not foolish enough to state dogmatically that any particular account of the afterlife is true, but all the accounts of the afterlife he gives has, have one thing in common, and that is that they have this positive effect on the soul. And it's a positive effect on the soul that we can appreciate in this life because all of these stories encourage us to take the maximum care of the soul we can in this life. And there are, there are real world benefits from that. Whether or not there's an, a, an afterlife and a last judgment, it doesn't mean that these are merely false stories. I think that he treats them as, as, as likely stories. I think that Socrates, in a way, is a kind of pragmatist about truth. And that he's willing to, he's willing to risk believing, and, and I think really believing, that there is an afterlife and a punishment of the soul after death, because he thinks that this is the best way of caring for his soul in this life. And if that's his view, then he's very much like someone like Pascal, yeah, or, yeah Pascal, or William James, and other people who have, who have offered this kind of argument for belief. It's a kind of will-to-believe argument that he's giving or Pascal's wager. The, the myth that Socrates gives, he calls a rational account. And what makes it rational? Again, it's rational because it serves the ends of the soul by making the soul better. That's, I think, what makes it rational. Okay. And, and, and it's constructed in a way that's guided by that rationale, if you will. So it's not just any old story. It's a story that is directed towards uh, the health of the soul. And what does he tell? He says, well, basically, Callicles, look, uh, in the age of Kronos, which was the previous age, uh, human beings, when they were about ready to die, would go off to a judge, and they would be judged by mortals, mortal men, and depending on the kind of life they led, they would be sent either to the Isles of the Blessed or to Tartarus, where they would suffer punishments. But this system didn't work. And when Zeus overthrew Kronos, his father, and took over the world, he divided the world up between himself and his two brothers. There was Pluto, who took the underworld, and Poseidon, who took the seas, and Zeus ruled over all the rest. And it was complained to Zeus that there were all kinds of bad characters hanging around the Isles of the Blessed, and good guys were being thrown into Tartarus. And the reason why is that the system of sorting, pe sorting people out was defective. Why? Well, because these people were judged with their bodies on. Their, their souls, they were judged while they were still alive, and they were judged by, by living beings. And so the souls of the people who were judged were clothed with their bodies, their reputations, and so forth. But under these beautiful bodies, or under these, uh, these sterling reputations, were often rancid, awful souls. But these people judged on the surface were sent off to the Isles of the Blessed. Conversely, there were people who were kind of ugly and stubby and Socrates-like, you know, who would show up at the judges and they would have a bad reputation, maybe, and have been slandered in their lives, and they'd be sent to Tartarus. But they had good souls. And so Zeus decreed the following. We will judge people after they're dead when the soul has been stripped of its clothing, namely the body, and stands naked before the judge. And we will also have dead judges, too, so that their souls will be stripped naked, and there will be souls confronting souls directly. And this will get closest to the truth about the soul. And so he appoints um, Minos and Radamanthus and Achaeus, I think is the, the, the third one, as judges, because they're dead sons of Zeus, who are now uh, the judges of the afterlife. And once people die, their bodies are stripped, uh, stripped away, and the soul goes to be judged. And the souls of potentates and tyrants and, and, uh, and the great king of, of Persia go naked without their, uh, without their bodies and without their reputations and without their pomp and circumstance, and they're judged. And, and the souls are found, as it's said, to be um, at the bottom of page 125, where it says 524E. So when they have arrived before the judge, those from Asia, before Radamanthus, 
Vedamantis halts them and contemplates each one's soul, not knowing whose it is, but often laying hold of the great king or some other king or potentate, he perceives that there is nothing healthy in the soul, but that it has been severely whipped and is filled with scars from false, false oaths and injustice. With each a action of his stamped upon his soul, and all things are crooked from lying and boasting, and there is nothing straight on account of his having been reared without truth. And he sees the soul full of asymmetry and ugliness, from arrogant power, luxury, luxury, wanton insolence, and incontinence of actions. And having seen it, he sends it away dishonorably, straight to the, to the prison, having come to which um, it is going to endure fitting sufferings. And then there are two kinds of sufferings. Socrates then argues that there are two kinds of sufferings. One is re re rehabilitation. Those whose souls are sick, but not incurably sick, undergo the kind of sufferings necessary to cure them and rehabilitate them. And who knows, maybe after this they can graduate and go into the Isles of the Blessed. However, some souls are so sick and corrupt that they cannot be cured, and therefore the only thing one can do is uh, torment them for all eternity and turn them, as, uh, turn them into examples to deter others from badness. Uh, but So what happens to a good man? And what are the good men who come to Hades? Well, on the bottom of 127, below the center where it says 526C, it says, Sometimes beholding another soul that has lived piously and with truth, a private man's or someone else's, but mostly, as I, for one, assert Calicles, a philosopher who has done his own business and not been a busybody in life, Radamanthus admires it and sends it away to the Isles of the Blessed. So you, in here we are back to this choice. What, what, what life do we lead? Do we lead the private life of cultivating and caring for the soul and trying to be the best human being you can be? Or do you lead the public life, which is the life of pandering to the many uh, in order to become wealthy and powerful and famous, only to be out of harmony with oneself, to be corrupt and unjust, to have a, a scarred and wicked soul. Which is the better life? And Socrates is saying, well, when you, when you strip away the body and the soul stands alone, it's very clear who has the better life. But even in this world, this side of the veil, right, of death, the people who live a just life are still better off because what happiness consists in is goodness, which is entirely within one's control as a human being. Whereas wretchedness, is, is a life lead, led in the rat race, pursuing, you know, worldly ends by trying to gain power over others and over nature. But again, this is an illusory life, because we can't be completely masters of our own destiny. And therefore, given the choice, that the best choice is to, is to lead the life in the care of the soul, which is the private life, the philosophical life. And this is actually the life of the true statesman, because it's only these people who know the, the, the true nature of the good. But one thing that's very important to recognize, and with that we'll stop, is this. Socrates gives here the strongest possible argument for why philosophers will never be kings. Right? They'll never be kings because they would have to flatter and pander to the people in order to gain power, which would cost them the very thing that they're trying to secure, which is the, which is the health of the soul. So true statesmen will never be statesmen in, in, in the city. Okay, philosophers will never become kings. Well, in, even in the Republic itself, the philosopher king is shown to be impossible. In the parable of the cave, things are set up this way. People in the cave will not want to be ruled by philosophers. And the philosophers will not want to rule the people in the cave. They'll want to stay with themselves outside in the sunlight. And uh, those who try and go down in the cave and release people will be killed, you know, or driven away. And therefore, there are, there are only two parties. There are the philosophers and the non-philosophers. Each one has completely opposing interests. One wants to remain in ignorance, and the other wants to remain safe in enlightenment. And so Socrates says to Glaucon, how will the philosophers become kings? And Glaucon says, I don't know. And Socrates says, well, we'll have to force them, won't we? But at this point, Glaucon should raise the question, who will force them? If we've accepted that there's a distinction, that there are two categories, philosophers and non-philosophers, 
each one of which has interests that drive them apart, who's going to force them together? There is no one who will force them together. Right? And therefore, the two will never come together. And philosophers, once they understand the real nature of philosophy, will not want to become kings. So even in the Republic, this is an in, a teaching intimated. And at the end of the whole discussion of all the cities and things like that, Glaucon says, we, we should stay out of politics. And Socrates says, well, yes and no. We should be concerned with the politics of the city that one is a true is truly a citizen of, which is uh, the politics of one's own soul. And, and that's, that's really the conclusion, which is, again, an argument for the, the private life, which is the philosophic life, as opposed to public life. The whole sort of utopian dimension of the Republic is called the city in speech, or the, the fine city, which is the Calipolis. But as it turns out, the Calipolis is something that can never come into existence. And so Socrates lays out what it would be, but it can't really it be. It can't exist. It can't really be, because you would have to have a number of things. You would have to have, he says, the equality of the sexes, which he regards as impossible. Children and wives would have to be held in common, which he regards as impossible. And philosophers would have to be king. None of these things can happen. And there are many ways in which, uh, you know, the, the, the arguments go. I mean, but uh, children and wives can never be held in common. Uh, well, I mean, Aristotle spells out the arguments. Why can't the sexes be equal? Well, because Socrates says that, uh, you know, he defines the equality of the sexes in terms of the soul, but then makes it very clear that it's precisely the body which is the most important thing when one uh, is, is trying to deal with... Uh, training people to be guardians, the police, right? It, it, it's, in the, it's in the guardian caste, the police and military caste, that there's supposed to be equality of the sexes. But he immediately abstracts away the, from differences of the body when he does this, but that seems to be the most relevant thing when you're talking about people in the police and the military, right? And, and so he, it's precisely in, in, in the physical arena that, that men and women are most clearly different. He argues that there will be no personal sexual preferences amongst the guardians, that there will be wives and children will be held in common. But the claim is that they will also exercise together in the nude. And the very idea that, that naked men can, can hide any sexual interest or preferences is, is again, uh, is based on a complete abstraction from the nature of the body. You know, a naked woman can, can hide the fact that she might be sexually interested in somebody, but a naked man really can't. 